uh, Dr. Henry, uh, who some of you may have actually uh, already had the pleasure of hearing from. I had a nice uh, chat for 15 minutes or so with, with uh, Dr. Henry and Dr. Glazer this morning, and just appreciate having both of them here as they've both done some looking um, at the Tennessee Achievement School District. And so he's going to present to us, and then we'll have some time for Q&A with him. Thank you very much, Chair O'Brien. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and a pleasure to uh, have a chance to share with you and respond to your questions this morning about uh, what we've looked at uh, uh, and found with respect to Tennessee's Achievement School District. Uh, Lake is certainly a, a, a very convincing and a really terrific uh, leader for that uh, effort in Tennessee, and uh, uh, we look forward to, to uh, seeing much success uh, under her leadership. Just a little bit of background, as you all uh, probably already know, Tennessee was the only state successful in the first round of Race to the Top uh, 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 funding and received $500 million, uh, the largest sum uh, possible from the federal government uh, for the First to the Top initiative that they uh, uh, started in Tennessee. Uh, as a part of that initiative, they identified 83 uh, schools uh, in the 5% of the lowest performing schools in the state. Um, the, um, the legislation uh, um, authorized the Achievement School District to uh, take over those schools. As Malika called it, it's a governance model. It pulled the schools out from the local education agency or the local school district and put them in a state uh, school district and they were authorized to either run them independently or find a charter operator who was willing to come in and, and work with those schools. Um, so some of them are directly run by the ASD, as, uh, as uh, Malika has said. Some of them were taken over by charter. This is a, a really fundamental point, number four. All of the ASD schools remain neighborhood schools. That is, there are not schools of choice. They serve the children in that neighborhood where they're located, which makes this a fundamentally different model than New Orleans or any other place, because this is uh, one of the few places in the country, uh, in fact, I think it's, it's unique in having charter uh, operators not operate the schools of choice. And I'll uh, explain some of the implications of that uh, in the uh, last bit of the slides. There was a, a second option in Tennessee, which was allowing uh, local school districts to take their schools out of their local district and place them in an innovation zone. They would remain part of the local school district, but they uh, were operated by a separate entity within those districts. And here I'd like to draw a contrast with North Carolina. Uh, in Tennessee, these 83 schools, all but one, are in large metropolitan areas. So Memphis, uh, Chattanooga, and Nashville all have I zones. And, that, uh, and uh, Knoxville also has a few of these schools. Only one school uh, in that group of the 5% of lowest performing is not in an urban area. Uh, North Carolina has numerous schools in their lowest uh, uh, percent that are not in urban areas. So that, that will be a, a difference that we can come back and, and talk about a little bit. So uh, in the last slide, I'm going to touch on uh, some of the implementation issues that you may want to consider. Uh, for instance, in the first year of operation, uh, the uh, students' IEPs were not necessarily transferred to the charter operators when they came in. Neither, uh, many of the charter operators uh, in their schools of choice exclude students with disabilities. So in that effort, it took a 22-week observation period in some cases for um, kids to uh, be observed and to go through the protocols to place them in an IEP rather than having that, uh, that uh, transition be as smooth as, uh, as we would all like it to have been. Uh, so there are other issues that I'll, I'll talk about, but I just want to raise a few of those as we go through because I think it's things that, that uh, if North Carolina chooses to move forward uh, uh, with the ASD type legislation, uh, it could be quite different and, and learn from some of the issues that were raised uh, in Tennessee. 
So the Tennessee context, as I just said, uh, there, uh, those 83 schools that I mentioned were put into one of three groups. Uh, first is the Achievement School District, and there have been more schools over time, I'll go into the numbers in just a minute, added to that Achievement School District. Uh, the Innovation Zone, uh, district run, three districts, Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, uh, are the three districts where we have Innovation Zones. Uh, and they've taken about five to 10, and Memphis is continuing to add uh, to, to uh, the number of schools in their innovation zone. And then there's a third group of schools that uh, have a school improvement plan that is much like the school improvement plan that's required in North Carolina for the low performing schools in the legislation, House Bill 97 last year uh, that was passed. Uh, those have only local uh, initiatives. They're not placed in the zone. Uh, and there is very uh, little sign of systemic reform in those, uh, in those schools. So um, of that 5%, um, uh, what I'm going to focus on today is evaluating the impacts, uh, particularly of two groups of schools, the I-Zone schools in the three districts and the ASD schools. And I'm also going to break down the ASD by the state run versus the uh, charter management organization. So all the work that I'm presenting today was funded by, uh, the evaluation work was first funded by the uh, Race to the Top initiative, and our continuing funding is from the Walton Family Foundation to support this effort. So I'll break down the impacts by, uh, by subject level in all of these schools. I'm going to focus today on uh, achievement score changes rather than proficiency rates. And the reason for doing that is as, as Malika has mentioned, many of these students are performing two to three to four years below grade level. So it might be only four or five years of intervention moves them over proficiency. So we want to be sensitive, are they, are they coming closer to proficiency over time rather than simply did they, did they make that one bar? So that's the reason I'm going to talk about uh, uh, test scores today rather than proficiency rates. Um, I'm going to look at the uh, effects of uh, I-Zone and ASD compared to uh, very similar schools in that priority but no systemic reform. I'm also going to look at the differences between I-Zone and ASD and offer you those. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to get a lot into the differences but, uh, uh, or the methodology, but just to say what we did is chart the trajectory of these schools over time, all of them, and then look at the point where they uh, came into the ASD or into the I-Zone and what happened over the next three years. So we're comparing the trajectory in the past to where they ended up uh, for both the schools that received one of these two interventions and the schools that did not receive a systemic intervention. So to, to look at these numbers, uh, you see that the total priority schools uh, started out, uh, one was uh, closed immediately, a couple split, but uh, by the last year for which we have data, which is our last complete school year, 2014-15, 77 of those remain. 28 of those have not been intervened with. And so one of the things I'd like to contrast the situation in North Carolina slightly, North Carolina had the most ambitious uh, school transformation and turnaround program in the country under Race to the Top. They went into all 117 schools and that represented a full third of all the states that had the Race to the Top funding. So um, there are 28 schools in North Carolina that through the end of Race to the Top did not receive the systemic reform. Uh, and by the way, I'm I, I formerly from UNC Chapel Hill and uh, also have evaluated the, the turnaround schools here in North Carolina, so that's, that's why I can speak a little bit about what's happened in, uh, in both states uh, at this point. So as you see, there are five current ASD-run schools. Um, there are 18 uh, CMO-run schools for a total of 23 schools. And then uh, in total in the, um, uh, in the I zone, we have 26 schools. So, about a third in each of these three groups. So let me get right to the point 
uh, about effects. What we observed over three years in all the schools that uh, appear in the ASD or the I zone, the uh, I zone schools are represented uh, by the light blue, and I can assure you it's not because of the NC2A tournament that I chose light blue. Uh, uh, it just happened that way. It actually looks a, a little different color on my screen, so I, I apologize for that. Uh, uh, but you can see that um, in, in these terms for reading, math, and science, the I-Zone schools uh, in the blue have positive, moderate to large, statistically significant effects. Every one of those three uh, school districts shows positive effects in one or more of these test scores. Memphis shows in all three uh, positive effects of the I zone. Now let me uh, give you an idea about uh, how I interpret those to, to, to see if this is helpful. As you all may recall, many years ago in Tennessee, there was a class size experiment where they reduced class sizes for kindergartners and first graders from about 24 or 25 to 14 or 15. Now you can see that would cost a lot because you could have a lot of extra teachers. The effect size for that study is 0.22 in the same exact metric that you have here. So the effect of the I zone is functionally equivalent to a 10 student per class reduction in class size. These effects are what we consider in education large and significant. Now, reading was only uh, about two-thirds of that, but still a moderate to large effect. Now, that contrast with the ASD, you see um, uh, over the three years, on average, a growth of 0.04% uh, of a standard deviation unit. I'm sorry, I had to say that. Um, but the, uh, uh, each of those is substantially smaller than the I zone. None are statistically significant. So uh, our conclusion is that the, um, that the schools in the ASD are doing about the same as those schools that weren't taken into any systemic reform. The schools in the I zones um, are doing substantially better and the students are scoring substantially higher. Now this is a question that I think is very important to, to consider. And, and uh, Malika alluded to this, and I just want to underscore it. It is not clear to me or to many people in Tennessee that the I zone, the schools in the I zone, would have had any effect without the potential of state takeover represented by ASD. In other words, these schools had been left in the state they were in, in their district, for a very long time. And so this legislation may have been what I call the action forcing mechanism on the part of those local school systems to take over those schools and to do something different. And uh, for instance, uh, I've, I've got a slide later I could talk about this. Um, what principally happened in Memphis, for instance, was that uh, behind the I zone was they, uh, they called out the teachers who were uh, uh, low performing and they weren't renewed in those schools. They gave a 14% raise on average to the high quality teachers in those schools to stay and they gave on average a 17% raise for teachers outside of those schools who were high quality to come into those schools. So principally, uh, as, as Malika alluded to, uh, uh, these models, the ASD model is a governance model. It changes the authority and the accountability mechanisms for those schools. The I zones are not, do not affect governance, but they affect, if you think about it this way, governance, management, day-to-day -day operations, teaching and learning in the classroom. Their reform is focused on teaching and learning in the classroom, and we know uh, and I can show you evidence from North Carolina, if you care to see it, that the most important factor in students' achievement is the teacher they have before them. The second most is the leadership of the school. So if, 
if it's a governance-based model, there has to be assurances placed that something actually happens in the classroom and teaching and learning. By management type, uh, and here again in the blue shows you uh, the effects of the I zones. You see that the CMO schools uh, have uh, small and statistically insignificant effects <coughs> on student achievement. We do see positive effects in the ASD run schools, those that Malika and her staff run directly, hire the principals, hire the teachers, run them from the state, uh, and, and in fact, I think Malika probably spends uh, a good deal of her time between Nashville and Memphis uh, uh, to, to be able to oversee these schools. You see a positive and statistically significant effect in the ASD run schools in math and in science. Uh, they're, they're about a third of the size of the effects of the ISO. <coughs> So I wanted to break that down just a little bit further to show you the effects in, in Memphis. Memphis has the largest concentration of the lowest performing schools in Tennessee. Uh, last week I, I did an exercise and I looked over the three years of, um, of uh, at, at the 5% of the lowest performing schools each of the three years before these initiatives were started in Tennessee and for all the years after. We only have one school that's broken into the top 50% from that bottom 5%. It's a, it's a significant, difficult problem, very difficult to sustain. But you see in this, uh, for instance, that, that uh, uh, Memphis, which is the uh, middle bar of all these three, shows uh, positive and even larger effects uh, in those schools in Memphis. Uh, we see positive effects in uh, Chattanooga in uh, reading. We see positive effects in uh, Nashville in uh, math. Uh, but the Memphis model seems to be providing the evidence of the largest uh, uh, effects on student performance. And one of the things that I, I didn't put the slide up, again, I can show you this uh, in a few minutes if you are interested, uh, but the uh, the, the large positive effects that we've seen in the ASD uh, have come principally in math in the third year. Now those effects, uh, Malik is correct that they, um, in, in the last year, they had a high gain. In the second year, they lost nearly a half a standard deviation, so much larger than any of these positive effects in math. And in this third year, they partially rebounded. So they do have large positive effects off of a low, uh, uh, low, uh, a sharp decline in the in the second year. So uh, our conclusion here: the Island schools have moderate to large positive effects in reading, math, and science, all the subjects that are tested in Tennessee. Um, overall, the ASD schools did not gain more or less than the other priority schools that received no systemic reform. Um, the ASD schools do show, ASD run schools show some positive effects in math science, uh, and the CMO schools did not gain more or less than the priority schools. Now, uh, one of the things that we can point to, uh, in the first year of operation, for instance, in those CMO, it's what the federal government calls a restart. There was not a single teacher rehired uh, who had previously worked in that school when the CMOs took over. All of their teachers were new. So you can imagine that first year being a transition phase that Malika pointed to. And principally, uh, it's, it's bringing in a new set of teachers new to the area, often brand new teachers. Uh, we did see that both the Memphis I-Zone and the ASD uh, um, schools brought in very high quality teachers as measured by experience, by uh, their prior value added scores, if they've been teachers before. So they're doing a very good job of recruiting. Uh, one issue that, that, that has come up over and over again, though, is that uh, the teacher labor force in these schools simply is not stable, and the learning and development that those teachers have in one year is not likely to be sustained because they're leaving those schools at a rate of about a third of the teachers leave every single year. 
So when you're thinking about this issue, it's a tremendous problem. Uh, Malika talked about a human resource problem. There is a huge and difficult human resource <coughs> problem in these low-performing schools. Generally, we see a pattern that teachers who are successful in these schools who want to stay in teaching uh, exit out to uh, less challenging environments after two to three years. Um, and on, on average in North Carolina, 50% uh, of the new teachers are gone within five years. That rate is half again as high in the lowest performing schools. So it's a significant challenge. Um, I want to be clear, it is possible that the I-Zone effects would not have been possible without the pressure of state takeover from the ASD. So we can't rule out that possibility. Um, uh, so it, it may suggest, however, that a governance strategy is not uh, needed to actually reform the schools. But uh, I can tell you that in my experience over many years working in many states doing uh, this kind of work, the local school districts are loath to treat any school or any teacher differently than anyone else. And the issues in these schools, as I've pointed to, with teacher turnover and some of the devastating issues in those uh, areas make it a requirement that these schools, uh, if, if the students are going to be supported uh, to learn and to move forward, these schools have to be treated differently than the school, than all the other schools. The circumstances are so dire and it's, it's so important that we reach these uh, students that we have to do something different. We, we hate to move away from that uniform pay schedule, but innovations like that may be needed to create the human resources in these schools that can actually begin to make a difference. So um, with that, um, I have a, a list of, of 10 considerations, and I'll go, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's okay, very quickly through that. Um, uh, is, is a, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I want to make sure we get some Q&A for you, sir. So, so uh, neighborhoods or school, uh, neighborhood schools or schools of choice. Uh, completely fundamentally different neighborhood schools. The charters have to take the students in that district, uh, uh, and that creates a different environment than they work in in other places in the country where they may say, we don't have the resources to serve students with disabilities and they can simply go to their neighborhood school, which is fine. But if that's the neighborhood school, that's going to have to change. So uh, uh, which schools are designated for takeover? Again, hu uh, huge controversy about how that's done uh, uh, in, uh, in Tennessee. I think Malik is bringing a lot to the table in terms of uh, uh, making this a smoother process. Uh, who will manage uh, uh, the matching process? Who can say, one of the reasons charters may work where they work is that they families can match their child's need to what the charter operator is doing. And that may be a fundamental piece of families working together to figure out where their kid would benefit the most. Now we're matching neighborhoods. And a, a total neighborhood may have kids with vastly different needs. So um, thinking about that, who will hold the charter management organizations accountable how, how will they be held accountable? How much autonomy? Uh, one of the things that Chris Barbic, before Malika and Malika, have talked about is autonomy. But where is the right level of autonomy? Is it at the operator or the teacher? What, how do we think about autonomy in this, uh, in this circumstances? Uh, a critical question in North Carolina is, can charter management organizations be recruited? Uh, the state of North Carolina has the most rural school system in the country. The most rural, we have more students in rural schools in this state than any other state in the country as the last time I looked at. Uh, the turnaround issues are prevalent in rural school districts. Charter management organizations may or may not be willing to go into rural areas to operate. I can also suggest to you that from our prior research, uh, it is going to be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for those local school, those rural 75 school districts, I think now in the state, have one high school. So in those 
school districts with limited capacity, uh, can you run an ISON? Because these ISON are pulled out, managed by a different group. So these rural schools create a very different issue in North Carolina than what's been faced in the lowest performing schools in Tennessee. Whole school versus grade turnover. You can imagine two different school systems operating in the same building. The teachers in our qualitative uh, interviews have said, um, and, and, and Josh can uh, 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 also speak to this with, with more authority, that it is a very difficult situation for them to be knowing that next year they're going to be gone and that their grade is going to be taken over. So thinking about that transition, uh, how will the needs of students with disabilities be met? A, a plan for transferring the IEPs, making sure a lot of times the parents aren't clear about what's in that IEP, so they're not prepared uh, to, to fully represent the, the needs um, for those kids. Uh, this is a human resource problem. How can teachers and principals be recruited and, and uh, retained in these schools is a very large problem. Um, and then uh, the last two, the parents and community, the kind of input you get on the front end and the back end. I would say the parents I've met with when visiting these schools, after two years, they're, they're very enthusiastic about the ASD schools. Um, uh, so I think there's a transition issue that uh, Malika also alluded to. And then finally, who will determine if the improvements are sufficient for these schools to be uh, uh, transitioned out and uh, will they remain charters or come back come back into the school system. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, happy to take your questions. Thanks. Please let us know if you get Representative Horn, I'm shocked. <laughs> so, sorry, I think I'm getting a reputation. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I greatly appreciate your perspective, especially since you have been involved in, in looking at North Carolina schools, uh, quite frankly, I, I will say that, that I, it just never occurred to me that North Carolina had the most rural school system in the country. That's uh, quite surprising to me, actually. I uh, never really occurred to me. But that also begets the challenges that, that you identified. Now, what I'd like you to, there's lots of things I'd like you to talk about, but particularly you really made the point that it's really not the governance, it's the classroom. So you talked about attracting and retaining high quality teachers in the classroom, as they say, where the rubber meets the road. So a couple of questions on how, you, how do you identify high quality teachers? And then, Given your experience here in North Carolina and your recognition of, of the ruralness of our school system, so how, do we, how are we going to not just attract them, retain high quality teachers in these low performing rural schools of which we seem to have an abundance? Thank you for those questions, Representative Ford. Uh, it is a, it is a, a challenge that, uh, and, and I, I want to be completely clear, we have more rural students uh, than any other state. Uh, we're, some states are a larger percentage of rural. Iowa, Idaho would be a larger uh, percentage, but we have more of those students than any other state here in North Carolina. So um, the, the, the challenge is that uh, I don't think we can continue to look at a salary schedule and a set of assignments that's one size fit all. That's all. We we can't uh, stay in that um, in that vein. Last year we ran a survey of teachers in these uh, lowest performing uh, schools, and uh, where we looked at three kinds of factors: uh, structural factors related to the teaching profession, like the salary schedule, bonus pay, some of those kinds of things, pay for performance. What what do they want there? And what, what, what are they most anxious to get away from? Number two are the school characteristics. Uh, uh, the demographics of the schools, the neighborhood they're in, and so forth, how far they are from their home. And third are malleable factors. And so in, in, uh, the, the, at the entry point, those structural factors make a huge difference. So the salary amounts, the structure of that salary makes a big difference for teachers deciding to come in to teach. And a lot of the folks 
Uh, for instance, you don't have any uh, of the lowest performing schools in the state in the western part of the state. Okay, so the, the very lowest, uh, in, in race to the top, not a single uh, school in the western part of the state. Why? Principally because the teacher labor markets in those areas function the way they used to do here in the 1950s and 60s. Women with uh, wanting to return home, incredibly capable, but uh, one of their best jobs if they want to raise a family home is still teaching in those local schools. So they have an, an advantage because they, they, they go to Western, they go to App State, they come back and they stay in, in the region. And that is not what's going on in the other two thirds of the state uh, of North Carolina. So you have very different labor markets that need very different responses in order to recruit and sustain those teachers uh, in those places. So um, I would say that the, I, I, I want to get to the malleable factors. There are principally four things that teachers who decide to move, uh, four or five things that, that push them out. Uh, the school's not safe. The discipline policy is not uh, enforced uh, systematically by the school leadership. Um, they, uh, they don't feel supported by the school leaders, uh, and they lack high quality professional development. In the low performing schools, those are five factors that are pushes out. So all the schools have to be operating in that way. Uh, I, I can tell you from our work on principals in North Carolina, uh, a big part of this problem is going to have to be solved at the building leadership level and the, and the level of how that principal distributes leadership within the school. So we can talk about the teachers, fundamentally important to crack that, but getting a school leader who creates those malleable, we call them malleable because they're really affected day to day by how the leader operates within that school. <coughs> so, um, uh, you know, I, I would say it's, it's not going to be solved by a one, you know, Performance pay on its own may, may not solve it, but it may be a part of the, a part of the uh, way to, to solve these problems. A brief follow-up, I promise. Follow-up. And it has to do with the pay issue, the differentiated pay. You mentioned that you provided a 14% raise to those teachers that would stay, where, stay there, the high-quality teachers that stay where they are, and a 17% raise for, to attract high teachers to come there. And now, I assume, therefore, your, your system, the state law, allows differentiated pay. Are there other factors in the differentiated pay besides just location, i.e., additional responsibilities, whatever? So, um, the, we, we don't have... Um, any other factor that we've been able to identify yet that uh, is changed in Memphis other than the amount of pay. They're put up there, they receive these, these are not bonus pay, this is built into the salary, so it's built uh, over time, it doesn't go away after a year. So um, the, uh, the only thing that we know right now and have been able to systematically identify are these averages increases in salary. I do think there's a big role for differentiated pay, and I think one of the things about the coaching model is we've got to use teachers in different roles to provide leadership in different ways. That hasn't occurred uh, as we, far as we can tell right now, and the study's ongoing, uh, in a systematic way in, in Memphis. Mr. Chairman, I sincerely apologize. Last one really <laughs> calendar flex. For your, for these, uh, see, ASIS, just comment on that. Yeah, uh, uh, I think all, to the best of my knowledge, every one of these schools operates for more hours uh, per day and more hours per week than, uh, than they did prior to systemic reform taking place. So, so there is flexibility. I'm not aware of any of the schools that have gone to the modified school calendar, for instance, that's used in Wake or has been used in Wake. Uh, so I can't, I can't speak to that, but I, I do know that they've had more time on task and they have, a, um, they have 
uh, a lot of supports built in for the teachers in terms of coaching and so forth. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Henry, I have a question that I'll go to Representative Gill, um, and then I think we're going to, I think hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it when we take a little five minute uh, break for folks. Um, on the principal question, and this is something we've been thinking about a lot, and I think you raise an interesting point. We actually passed what I think is a good uh, principal prep bill last year that we're, you know, work, working through. You know, the number of teachers we have is really large, and the change, the sort of the systemic change to getting all the teachers you want, and, and I mean, th that is a huge, we all understand it's a huge lift, but financially and, and just from a human capital perspective, you know, it, it seems to me, and I'd just be interested in any additional thoughts you have, that, that training up uh, excellent principals and, and whether it's whatever incentives they need to, to get into to those schools is, is, is in some ways a, uh, an, an easier and faster lift um, again, you've got to have both going on, I think. But I just be interested in your thoughts on: um, Does that mean um, if you're worried about budgets and things like that, should we prioritize more our sort of school principal leadership changeovers? I mean, is that have you seen that as highly significant? It, it, it is highly significant, and the work we've done in in uh, several states suggests that uh, a principal can be responsible for about. 5% of the variation in school, uh, in, in student achievement. So they do have an effect. The effect is three times larger for teachers. So the principal route by itself won't fill in the ranks for the teachers. So it, it, has to, it can't be an either or, it has to be a both and. And I will say that, that one of the fundamental problems in North Carolina, um, as of two years ago, there's about, uh, and, and just think about this difference. When a, when a teacher uh, finishes her prep program, she goes immediately into the classroom. So she's gone from her student teaching, uh, and in four months she's teaching. It's uh, about four and a half years after a principal finishes his um, um, uh, master's of school administration that they become principals, and, uh, and that they spend usually three or four years as assistant principals. Those uh, across the country, the AP has been demonstrated, uh, AP position has a major effect. If you're in a high value added school as an AP in North Carolina, you are a more effective principal when you go out. If you're in, a, if you're in an elementary or a middle school and you go into the same level of school, you're more effective uh, when, when you become a principal. So um, there are ways we can start to get smarter and better. The principal first step is to making sure those AP experiences are strategic and developmental rather than bad boys, books, and buses, uh, which is uh, commonly a role that uh, assistant principals, they do behavior, they make sure the buses come on time, and they order the textbooks and make sure they get to the classroom. That's not a strategic use when you want them to be strategic leaders who know how to develop the human resources within those schools. Just a quick follow-up, do we have any I don't know what the, I don't know if we have any data on folks that come in from outside of the traditional preparation model and have come in as principals. Has there been much examination of that? As a result of Race to the Top, we, uh, we in, in Race to the Top, they had three regional leadership academies, one in the Northeast, uh, close here, and then Sand Hills in the Tri area. Uh, we've looked, all, uh, as of the first three cohorts, there were 189 graduates of those programs. 5% uh, of them have actually reached the principalship at this point. Uh, and about, I think, 59% are in the uh, assistant principal's position. Uh, so we're, we don't see positive effects yet in terms of their evaluation ratings, but it's very preliminary. Some of these were worried that uh, the principals may, some of these principals may be promoted too quickly after these uh, experiences into a principalship without that AP experience to seize it and develop them. So we're, uh, we're, we're continuing to monitor to that and be happy to come back uh, to you on those results. Uh, Representative Gill, last question. We'll take a quick break.
Thank you very much. Uh, I want to know about the whole school versus the grade by grade uh, takeover. Uh, first of all, are there any grade by grade takeovers in uh, Tennessee? And what kind of culture exists in those schools uh, versus the whole school? Uh, there are several uh, grade by grade. The, uh, in, in one fact, in, in Nashville that we go to uh, most often, uh, Brick Church is a grade by grade takeover, for instance, uh, there in Nashville. Uh, it is very uh, difficult for the teachers who remain in that school uh, knowing they're going to be replaced the next year to, to build the enthusiasm that you would like to see on their part uh, because they, they're, they're participating in job search. Uh, so they're looking and their efforts aren't really focused. Uh, many of the charter operators refuse to do a whole school uh, transition transformation uh, because they like to build up from those from kindergarten and, and help those students all the way through. So it is a, it is a huge challenge uh, for the local school system and a huge challenge for the charter operators. Makes it incredibly difficult. This, the, the, it, it's just, we're, we're trying to mesh two models here and we haven't figured out the right uh, way to make them link up so that it's a smooth uh, transition.